you know, I can modify my, my statements accordingly. But the, the big disadvantage is these have been, I think, three really interesting series of comments. And a lot of, you know, a lot of what I, I expected would be said has been said. So let me try to, uh, my, my back is to the screen, but there's a little screen over here that I can look at too. And <clears throat> I have a printout of it here. Let me try to go quickly through and maybe give you kind of a personal, more of a personal uh, feel of Rio. I had not been at the Rio 1992 um, uh, summit. In fact, was not at all engaged in the early 90s on this. I was up in the House Armed Services Committee trying to trying to redo our, you know, post-Cold War military budget. Another big challenge. Continues to be a big challenge. Um, but uh, Green Cross itself had decided about six months earlier to get involved. We should have decided long ago. And Jacob and I were talking about the fact that I think a lot of the environmental groups were we're a little bit late to the game. Uh, NRDC probably uniquely, maybe TNC too. I don't know about UCAL and ELI, but uh, we were we were I think a bit late to the game to get involved. Nevertheless, I think we made a good presence. And let me, I pulled together a whole variety of pictures. We have a whole series of pictures up on the websites too, if you want to look at them. But uh, oh, let me go back. Oh, just click down. No, I want to go back. Just click. There's the website. There we go. Yeah, so this is this is sort of what we look like in uh, in Rio. Um, we had a big group there, and you may know the Green Cross has uh, thirty something like thirty five affiliates all over the world. So we had uh, a big turnout from uh, probably twenty countries, I think, all Green Cross X, Y, or Z. Green Cross Australia was there. Green Cross Japan was there. Green Cross Russia was there. Uh, Green Cross Brazil was there. Green Cross Argentina. Uh, we also had a big uh, youth delegation that our affiliate in uh, Switzerland, Green Cross Switzerland, had put together. And you see a lot of the, uh, the youth there in the front with the T-shirts uh, the on. We pulled those youth together. I think there were about 35 youth all together from uh, communities, cities, and villages that, that have been really impacted badly by uh, pollution and toxic waste contamination. And uh, in the United States, actually, we pulled... Um, Four young teenage women from uh, from two two sites. Uh, one called Pueblo, Colorado, where we work on a uh, chemical weapons stockpile destruction program. We do a lot of work right on the ground in, in sort of physical cleanup and remediation and all, and facilitation. And then we pulled a couple of young women from uh, uh, Bluegrass, Kentucky, to just downwind of the uh, or upwind of the. Uh, uh, of all the tobacco fields, actually in, in Kentucky, and the uh, and the big uh, horse race in Kentucky too. So you see, you have a sense here. We also partnered them with uh, with a favela in in Rio to try to give everybody a sense of this global, multicultural, multilateral process, and also the uh, questions about poverty as well. Um, Rio Centro now. Those of you who haven't been to Rio, I, I had a tough time just imagining what this was all going to be about when I flew down there, and I think probably you all did too. Uh, I must say, when I arrived in Rio, uh, I was really impressed with the good organization that the Brazilians had put together. We were picked up at the airport, uh, identified as to whether we were VIPs, VVIPs, or just NGOs. Uh, I was an NGO, <clears throat> and uh, and we were directed, though, the right shuttle buses and, and whatnot, and you know, dropped off directly at our hotels, and, and hotels were spread out over probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 mile range, all radius, all around the city. So you had really no idea how close you were to anything. And the Rio Centro, uh, which I guess we would call here sort of a conference center, uh, was about, what, 30 miles south of Rio, mm -hmm. something like that, 25, 30 miles south of Rio. So you, you had to take uh, a bus to get there. You could also do metro and bus. Uh, or a taxi, but um, it was a it was a long haul, and it took anywhere from one to three hours uh, to get from your hotel to to the uh, the conference center. So you had to commit to get on the shuttle bus at seven in the morning. Uh, you probably went back to your hotel room until nine o'clock at night. I mean, these were long, as you say, grueling days. Those of us who weren't even involved with the with the formal uh, government negotiations were just really tired. Uh, at the end of the day. The picture on the uh, left there um, is actually one of the, just the entranceway to the uh, to the Rio Central Conference Center, which was a series of sprawling buildings. You needed kind of a map, to a road map to even get around, and it could take you 20 or 30 minutes just to walk between the, the buildings. 
And the, uh, the picture on the right there, uh, the point I wanted to make is it was also a paperless conference. So I went in, I registered. Registration actually was quite well organized. You know, there were thousands registering. So you got your little badge, and it was very closely, uh, very uh, closely secure and contained with a lot of troops. I mean, you saw, it, you saw, it, you know, automatic weapon armed troops everywhere, all around the conference center and the like. Uh, but it was paperless. So when I went in and I looked for a program, you know, I thought, well, you know, how do I find out what's going on? And you had to stand in front of these big electronic monitors that scroll the uh, the different meetings. And every day there were probably a hundred meetings going on, if maybe more, uh, just in Rio Centro. And then, of course, you had side events going on all over Rio as well. So uh, it was it was just a sort of overwhelming process. Um, picture on the left there is actually of the of the official government plenary uh, session. Uh, a big, once again, a big sprawling building. Uh, I found it very dark, uh, low ceilinged, and difficult to kind of get around and figure out where everyone was, where all the government delegations were. On the right-hand side um, is the food court. Actually, in the food court itself had these giant screens on it, which broadcast actually the uh, the government presentations. Uh, I think I w a few minutes I watched Hillary Clinton speaking there, uh, and many other. Uh, you know, prime ministers and presidents. Um, but the food court alone, I thought, probably sat 5,000 people. I mean, it was, it was the size of a football field, the food court itself. So uh, it'll give you a sense. So what we did at Rio is we had four major events ourselves. Uh, we said one was called Green Cross Returns to Rio, uh, which was not at Rio Centro, but was downtown, uh, once again, 30 miles away uh, in the center of Rio at something called the Catulio Vargas Foundation, a very well-known, famous foundation in, in Brazil, uh, in the area called Botafogo, which is close to downtown Rio. Uh, it's titled that because Green Cross was really founded uh, at the 1992 summit, and it was just less than a year later that Mikhail Gorbachev was agreed to, to take over this new uh, green group called uh, Green Cross International. So for us, it was actually important to come back and, and kind of make a, at least make a make some impression and uh, hopefully some policy influence while we were there. Uh, we had something called the Climate Change Task Force, which is a Gorbachev-chaired group, uh, which released a, a very strong statement on climate change and the need to move forward on, on uh, limiting carbon emissions. That was at something called Pier Mawa, which was also in downtown Rio. Uh, then we did actually a, a fairly unique event called Fukushima and the Future of Nuclear Technology, because we didn't see anybody talking about uh, military, weapons-related, proliferation, war and violence, uh, fissile material, uh, radioactivity, all of that at uh, Rio at all. So we actually did a very nice forum there at one of the well-known universities called the Almeida University. And then we did uh, something at Rio Centro, actually, which was very interesting with a bunch of our board members um, called Shifting Sustainability Horizons. Um, I want to just mention the future we want. Uh, you mentioned it a little bit too, Jacob, but I wanted to just give you some of the key words. Uh, if you haven't read it, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend reading it, but it, it, for midnight reading, you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big document, takes a while to work through, and I'm glad I wasn't involved in the negotiations at all. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, if you read through it, my sense is that there really are very strong and important, I think, verbal commitments on all sorts of good things. Sustainable, I, I've listed a bunch of them here that I just pulled out. This isn't all of it, but sustainable development, poverty eradication, environmental protection, food security, the rule of law, gender equality, empowerment of women, just and democratic societies, rights of children. And then they break down specific thematic areas, which I'm sure were very tough to, to agree on, um, called poverty eradication. Once again, I think that really is a major theme, as, as a couple of people mentioned. Food security and nutrition and sustainable agriculture. Uh, water and sanitation, energy, <coughs> sustainable tourism, which was kind of a surprise to me. Uh, sustainable transport, sustainable cities and human settlements, health and population, full, uh, full and productive employment, oceans and seas. There was a lot of sessions actually on the oceans, and uh, we had one of our board members, Jean-Michel Cousteau, uh, the son of Jacques Cousteau, who was, who was there and very prominent and, and extremely critical uh, of uh, global governments of the, governance of the oceans. Uh, small island developing nations, you know, the Maldives had a major presentation there. We, we've worked actually in New Orleans, actually, with, with the president of the Maldives on, 
on uh, ocean rise and all. Uh, least developed countries, uh, landlocked developing countries, Africa. Africa at all these forums, I think as you've gathered from my colleagues here, really has a growing presence um, in all the debate. And uh, it does indicate, I think, the growing importance of a larger multilateral and non-aligned movement uh, influence on these multilateral forums. Disaster risk, risk reduction, climate change, forest, biodiversity, diverse. You know, you can go, go on down. Chemicals and waste, which I thought was important. Uh, mining, education, gender equality. Um, and the one thing I think important for those of us in Washington, D.C., too, was sustainable cities. There was a lot, there's a lot in the statement on sustainable cities. Uh, and they talked about holistic approach to urban development, affordable, everything we've talked about and continue to in the D.C. environmental network, uh, affordable housing, poverty eradication, conservation, revitalization of historic districts, rehabilitation of city centers, increasing public awareness, enhancing public participation, decision making, they talked about transparency, all, you know, transport, energy, the, the phrase reduce, recycle, reuse, the three R's. Um, and you can go through the rest of this. You know, this is, this is all really what I think uh, we find very important in all the communities we work in. Uh, and the point is continually made that cities, in fact, will, will be a growing percentage, actually, of the, world, of the growing world population. So a focus on cities, carbon emissions, sustainability, green space, the whole nine yards is very important. I thought that was very, very positive. Um, but, you know, there, I'd point out just a few things. In general, I found the document lacking in any sort of binding commitments, which I'm sure my, my colleagues would, would agree on. And that was sort of my, my main, not surprising, but kind of my main, I think, criticism of, of Rio. But those of us who work in multilateral forums, and I, I've worked in a lot of multilateral forums over the years, uh, not this size per se, but certainly with this number of countries. Um, the big one I work in on a regular basis is, is the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, which has 188 states' parties and observer groups, and there's, you know, a thousand of us in the room and at all times when we're there. You know, it did reaffirm, for example, to me, important the importance of freedom, peace, and security. That phrase is only mentioned once, though, in the, you know, 200 and odd, 280 odd paragraphs in the whole sentence. So a lot of the issues we work on, you know, nonviolence, conflict resolution, uh, weapons demilitarization, uh, high toxic waste remediation, I just didn't find recognized very much uh, at all there. And it may, it may be partly, you know, in recognition that environmental groups don't spend a lot of time on these issues, which I find very sad. And we, we try to bridge the gap between the arms control and peace communities and the environmental communities, as I know NRDC does quite a bit uh, as well. Um, the second point I made here, one quote is, we recognize the critical role that energy plays in the development process. And there was a, was a, a, a new group they called Sustainable Initiative, uh, called Sustainable Energy for All. And that's very good, I think. And there was, I think, some mention about overcoming uh, subsidies for fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, there was absolutely, I think, no mention of nuclear power and fissile materials and the, and the growing uh, real crisis in that whole area that, in fact, we find uh, since Chernobyl and Fukushima, and that may be indicative of the power of, you know, the nuclear energy lobby, uh, lobbies. Um, a lot of mention of water and oceans. Uh, there was a very good forum I attended with uh, with uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau and many others too on, on ocean oceans there at Rio Centro. It says we recognize that water is the core of, the, of sustainable development. It's most of the world, as we know. Um, but there's no mention of the 800 million without access uh, to water, the 2.5 billion without sanitation. I didn't find any mention of the Water Courses Convention. A lot of the things we work on, maybe I'm, I could be wrong, because uh, I may have I may have missed some of this too. Once, once again, we were all just sort of one little people running around and 50,000 people in this group, you know. Lastly, I'd say here, uh, we recognize the importance of universal health coverage. I think very important and good to mention. But there was no mention of strengthening the World Health Organization, of universality with the Biological Weapons Convention, and disease management and surveillance, any of that. So let me mention a couple of Green Cross statements um, that you'll find on our website. Green Cross itself has stated as an organization, um, there was an unsustainable outcome reached at the UN conference, a disappointing lack of leadership, hidden its lack of results behind the fig leaf of a green economy. I want to debate over green economy. You mentioned, Colin, how you define that. Is this good or bad? 
Uh, we also stated the global realization that the balance of things in this planet has shifted irrevocably, Rio a shift in the way the world sees, understands, and governs itself. So that was important. I would also say that our youth delegation, uh, members of whom spoke many times, and I think in some ways garnered a lot of the good attention uh, there, uh, the, uh, all of the youth that were there, uh, they stated itself from their st statement, every child has a right to live in a clean and healthy environment. We need action from governments now. So they were actually quite outspoken and had our support to do that. Um, the task force, oh, just go back one, yeah, the task force itself, the big event we held uh, in downtown Rio stated climate change will not, it will be solved or not based on measures implemented by cities. And this was from the uh, Martha Delgado, the Minister for Environment in Mexico City on behalf of the World Mayor's Council, which, which joined us. Uh, I think two more slides. I also want to mention Severin Suzuki. Does everyone here know Severin Suzuki? You know, um, you know she was actually there. She spoke at uh, two of our events. Um, you know, she's a very prominent uh, environmental activist in Canada and the daughter of, of David Suzuki. And the picture you see there is is a press conference that was held actually with Severin and David. Uh, David's there on the right, white hair, and uh, and Severin is is on the left. She's a very st strong critic, particularly of Canada. Uh, had no positive things at all to say about the government of Canada, um, which is different, I guess, from some of the Canadian government statements there. But she said, we have to find solutions ourselves. Citizen engagement need a massive paradigm shift. Intergenerational justice is what sustainability is all about. So she's very much still involved as a 32-year-old uh, mother of a couple of children now uh, versus 12 years old when she spoke in 1992. Uh, she's actually a very strong spokesperson, I think, for youth still. So, let me just make a couple of final points. You know, Rio was an important gathering. Uh, I, I don't want to be overly critical of it at all to underline the current environmental crises we all face. And I think, I think Carl and, and uh, Andrew and Jacob have all said that too. But in the final statement, the future we want, which I urge you all to read, as I said, uh, is an excellent aspirational consensus document worth reading. Um, it's good. I mean, I, I think all the right phrases for the most part are in there. But as someone who's dealt with a lot of, you know, consensus documents over the years, last 25, 30 years or more, frankly, there's, there, from the document itself, there's no action taken. I mean, there may be a couple of final little things in there you can see, but there are no enforceable goals, nothing binding, nothing mandatory. And it's really one of the challenges I think we as NGOs continue to find uh, with multilateral operations that, that it's very difficult in a sort of least common denominator, or most common denominator, I'm going to say, least or most common denominator group, to build, build consensus around real action in binding, in binding uh, agreements. So I'm really glad to see that, you know, there are up to 700 or more pledges have been made and commitments. I mean, Hillary Clinton, I know, made something like a $20 million commitment to the sustainable energy for all, uh, particularly in Africa, two billion, Africa. Two billion. Two billion. Two billion. Two billion. And she made some sort of a commitment around, uh, uh, cook stoves in Africa, I remember. That's one of the things that stuck out too. But I know from our experience in the past with the global part the variety of global partnerships uh, that we see around the globe, you really have to hold these countries accountable. And there are some really many glaring uh, failures to follow through on their pledges. In the, in the enthusiasm and energy of the day, you can get countries say, oh, yeah, we're going to do this and this and this, a billion here and a billion there. As I say, and it's real money eventually, but they don't follow through. And uh, that's happening a lot more and more these days from particularly uh, Western, Western Europe and uh, the United States and Canada uh, because, frankly, the money is tight, increasingly tight. So my bottom line is it's really up to us. You know, it's, it's up to groups like DC Environmental Network. It's up to NGOs and all to hold their feet to the fire and, and make progress, which I think is in agreement with what others have said. So... Final couple pictures, uh, beautiful scenes of Rio there on the left. Uh, the final day I had a couple hours that I actually finally got to one of the beaches and were able to take a few pictures. Um, and uh, that's actually Sugarloaf, the mountain you see there, which is one of the large mountains that you can go up the top of. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is actually the People's Summit. You know, there was Rio Centro, 30 miles south of Rio, and then there was the People's Summit, or the Alternative Summit, which was actually in Rio along the beach for about two miles. Uh, really spread out, uh, open, open booths and 
and forums and the like. Uh, unfortunately, the morning I went, it had rained heavily uh, a couple hours before, and about a third of the people summit was shut down because it was too muddy. You couldn't even you couldn't even walk through without getting mud up to knees. It's mostly outdoors and all, but still a very interesting presentation. So that's that's it. Yeah. Okay. Good.